until about 1980. Uh, there were earlier pictures because it happens to lie close in the sky to the bright spiral galaxy NGC 3079, which makes it way easier to find this than it might otherwise be. So it happened to show up in the corner of some pictures back in 1903 and 1950. So you could actually go back and measure how bright the, the two lensed images had been then to help establish a baseline. Nobody would have known what to make of it until about 12 years later when Einstein first started working on the gravitational deflection of light and general relativity. And then it was well into the 1930s before there was even the theoretical understanding that under particular rare astronomical circumstances, you could see the same object more than once or distorted and net brightened. And then in 1937, Fritz Vicky took that, that information from Einstein's paper and wrote a one-page paper in the journal Science in which he laid out all the reasons that gravitational lenses are interesting. You can learn about mass distributions. You can find things by mass without light. You can extend the range of your largest telescopes. You can use large masses, as he wrote about in galaxies, to see fainter objects and more detail in them than you could with whatever the largest extant telescopes are at a particular time. And this has now turned not just from a curiosity, but to a serious tool in astrophysics. So I've, I've noticed, as you've been talking, Bill, that now several of us have started sharing different objects of, that are examples of these gravitational lenses that the Space Wars Project is looking at. And now there's four or five of us, which leaves Phil and Aphrodita to tell us, uh, what do you see? Can you expand on what Bill was saying? What exactly are these things that we're looking I'll at? I'll have to find a better lens to put up for them, too. Okay. <laughs> well, I, okay, I've seen this one that, um, uh, that Brooke's showing before. We, we've seen that in the zoo. Yeah. So this, this was spotted by a number of people in, in the Galaxy Zoo. It's, I, I think this is a candles image, is it? It is. Um, but actually, this was... Uh, first noticed in the CFHTLS survey, which is the one that we're, we're looking at at the moment in, in Space Wars. Um, there the, the data, are, the images are taken from the ground with the Canada France and the telescope. And th this lens looks a little bit different in, the, in those images, but I recognize that great big red arc and the other, and the other elongated features around it, they're also uh, lensed as well. It's a good one, this. 0217, it's called. So if I remember this correctly, I was looking at the paper for this one. And uh, the, the paper says that, so this right here, this arc, this big one, is twinned with this little guy right here, right? Yeah, yeah that's right. And they're both galaxy, they, they're a single galaxy at redshift like 1.8 or something. Um, and then this galaxy here, I think, is also a lens. Is that correct? It's been lensed, yeah. Yeah. yeah yes. Sorry, been lensed. Yes. Yeah. Actually, yes. You should make make definitely sure that I'm clear on my jargon. I don't want to use the jargon incorrectly because I am not a gravitational lens expert the way you do. Actually, before we go any further, Aphrodite, do you want to do you want to clear this up for everybody? Yeah. Sure. So basically, if you if you take away this red arc and the little dot that's on the opposite side and that other elongate feature, you just get left with this kind of really bright, um, centrally dominated yellow galaxy, and that's a, a massive galaxy. And what you need to do is kind of imagine it without those features, and these galaxies are actually lying behind that yellow galaxy. And the only reason that they pop out in the images is because they're being gravitationally lensed, and they basically the light from the background galaxy is being um, kind of stretched around or deflected around this, this yellow galaxy that's lying between us and them. And that's what gives rise to these really quite spectacular features. So you see this gorgeous red arc, um, and basically, well, Phil can demonstrate perhaps shortly yeah. um, why, you don't, why you see it in those kind of morphologies. So arcs are quite typical um, when you see lensed features. And um, the little red dot that's paired with it, as Brooke mentioned, is basically 
you can kind of draw a circle that would complete that arc and pass through that that um, little companion red blob on the other side. So you can oh. imagine these kind of kind of circles around that central galaxy. Now they don't have to be circles, right? They don't have to be circles, but oh, the images can be like. <laughs> so, and they're also, they're distorted, right, as well? Um, so you see these little arcs that are distorted images of the galaxy, but they're also magnified. Yeah, so basically if, if normally, it, it depends on the magnification, but these galaxies that you're seeing typically wouldn't have been picked up um, in a normal or in a similarly sensitive survey. So the lens actually boosts the light so you can start to detect them. So Say you had an unlensed version of that galaxy, of the background galaxy somewhere else in the field, it would be so faint that you couldn't really do really good astrophysical tests with it. Um, but the fact that they've been magnified and also distorted and stretched, like mentions, means you can detect them, but you can also look at a lot more detail. Because if you imagine that, that huge red arc that you actually see is something incredibly small. Um, lying behind the yellow galaxy. So it's actually stretching out all the light and magnifying it. And then you can actually look at individual regions within these background galaxies that you couldn't do if it hadn't been lent. Yeah. So I see Bill is showing an example here with, with a, some different images of what happens when you pass a gravitational lens in front of a galaxy whose image you recognize. But actually, there's, there's an easier demo that people can do themselves, right? Yeah, okay, so Bill, we, we don't expect to see any lenses <laughs> that look like that. <laughs> so what Bill was doing, he, he, had a, he was showing a, a little model of something like a black hole, right? Because you couldn't see any lens there, right? There was just a, a hole where, where it was bright. Right. And so you know, that, that's the kind of thing you, you, you might see if there was a road black hole that flew across in front of a huge, well-resolved galaxy that was very nearby. But we don't expect that to happen almost at all. <laughs> so most of the lenses we're looking for, you see the lens. So the lens galaxy is the massive yellow elliptical galaxy that Abhijit points out. That's the lens. It's doing the lensing. It's causing the light to deflect around it. And then the thing in the background is a light source. That's the lensed galaxy, the thing that has been lensed by the lens. And we, like I say, we expect to be able to see all the lenses. They're going to be bright yellow or orange or red massive galaxies. So uh, can you show us sort of geometrically what's going on in a lens? Uh, yeah, I, mean... so I think Karen had a good example. Maybe it was Kyle. One of you had a, a, a quad lens. Oh yes, Karen had the, the the cross up, right? Yeah. Do you think you can reproduce that with some some simple? Yeah, so just just like Bill had a little model black hole that he was moving across in front of that galaxy, we can make a model lens uh, out of one of these. A wine glass. Wine glass, yeah. So you might have seen me do this in a video on the on the web. It's certainly out there. So I'll, I'll put the link to that at the end of the blog post when I write that yeah, up. But, yeah, yeah. but do it again here because it's a great demo. Okay, good. But let's first let's look at Karen's picture. So and now put, this is my picture, which is uh, Hooker's lens up. or the Einstein cross. Yeah. The viewers will be seeing it big right now because I'm focusing on it. So go ahead. Okay. All right. So Phil, can you remake that? Yes. Okay. So here, here's my. Actually, it's Kyle's. <laughs> Uh, it's very small. Here's a little model quasar. You all see that? Like being right. a dentist, that's nice. Right. Um, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to put the model lens in front of it like this, okay? So there's the wine glass. And we're going to use the base of the wine glass. Getting there, getting there. You definitely see some stuff happening. You see two images, three images. Oh, oh, look! I've got a cross. Yeah. So it's quite so hard to do. But this is showing it takes a particular <laughs> configuration, right, to make this this cross. Yeah. It, it takes a very specific thing. And so then what do you do with these images once you have them? Because we're asking the public's help. We go to spacewarps.org and, and we're asking the public's help to find these things. And then what happens? First of all, how often do you expect to find these things? 
Not very often. In a big sky survey, there should be uh, a fair few, but they're still very rare. So most of the images you see on spacewalks uh, probably won't contain lenses unless we put them there as simulated lenses. Oh, but why um, would you do that? Why would we do that? <laughs> we would do that m mainly to, to sh give you a better idea of what lenses look like. Every time you see a simulated lens on space warps, uh, you learn a little bit about what can happen, what lenses can do, and it means that you'll be better prepared for when you see one for real. Okay. Um, I, now, I admit, I've been on the site, um, I spent some time yesterday on the site. I tend to try all the new projects. I did about 30 or 40. They're really fast and easy and fun. Um, and it sometimes told me, when I'd look through the images and, and I'd go, I don't think there's a lens here, you know, and I'd go, well, next, and just not have tagged a lens, and it would be like, correct, there's no lens here. So how do you know that, and why do you ask us that? Well, okay, so one of the things we've spent a lot of time doing is looking at images. <laughs> <laughs> so a few weeks before the survey started, um, Anna Prisa Moray, who couldn't be with us today, but she's the one who's prepared all the data, she made a set of about 600 images and asked us to look at them to see if we could see any lenses. And so we looked as careful as we could and we selected 450 that, that didn't contain lenses. And so we then defined those as our, our duds. And duds are, I mean, they're as important as the simulations, right? Yeah, for sure. Especially considering most of the fields you're going to see won't have lenses in. And it's, it's kind of very tricky as well to kind of um, see things that are kind of aligned and kind of look like a lens and not really know whether you should click them or not. And these studs kind of reinforce, you know, when you, you see an, an image and you don't think there's something in there, at least you get a confirmation on some of the things that you're looking at that they really are empty. And that's just as valuable as knowing that there is a lens or a simulated lens within the frame you're looking at. Yeah. In fact, you, you can think of every image on Space Warps contains a discovery. Either we'll discover that it contains a lens, or we'll discover that it doesn't contain a lens. Okay, I like that thought. We'll do all of the images like that until there are none left. So, uh, okay, so I don't know how many of our viewers have actually uh, tried this, um, but I thought that it would be interesting to take us through it. So what if what if we tried a bit of space warps? Yeah, let's go. All right. Are you gonna do that? Yeah. Here I am. I am on space warps. Nice. Okay. So I'm gonna try to use it, and I have done this before. So there is a tutorial. I'm gonna skip basically. I'm not gonna see it. I think. Um, okay. So you're taken to this, and there is an example of. You can all see this, right? Yep. Okay. There is an example of a lens right here, and. If I click here, discover lenses or get started, if I click the big blue get started button. Okay, now what do I do? I'm gonna search through this, correct? And yeah. see if I see something that looks like a lens. What about this right here? Well, Brooke, you, you so? tell us, what do you think? Well, I think that that doesn't look like a lens to me. I think that because I'm looking at the spotter's guide and there's a bunch of little things here that, that are under the non-lenses category mm. that are just sort of blue smudgy things that happen to appear right next to something, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and so if it was a lens, there ought to be, in many cases, there's like a, a twin image like we saw before, like there are two dots for a distant quasar, or this will have multiple different arcs. Um, but this one doesn't have anything like that, right? I guess it looks a little bit like the, the image image that Bill showed at the start, you know, a with bit, blue, blue yeah. pointers. But in these images, they're deep enough and they're high enough resolution that we should really see the lens. Right? We should see the, the yellow light from the massive galaxy in between those two blue, blue point sources. And we don't, so it's not a lens. Right, so these two are not a lens yeah. together because there will be something in between, and this is not nearly big mm. enough. And Brooke, what have you clicked on? Like how you're able to zoom in on the image? Right. So there's a there's a tool which what what do you call it again, Phil? Quick it's a, a little button here, and what it does is it allows you. You click this right here, and it allows you to uh, explore the image. And so I can I can zoom in, and in my case I'm using a Mac, so I can use. Oops, 
it's easier if I'm actually clicking correctly. Uh, so I can use my normal scrolly tools to zoom in and look around and I can click brighter to see a brighter version, bluer to see a bluer version, etc. And that can help spot faint lenses and things, right? Oh, so that, that blue view is good. Can you go back to the blue view? Yeah. What would I be looking to yeah, see, some, actually? Some of our science team like the brighter view, and some of them like the bluer view. But in this case, I like the way the bluer view shows you that those two objects are different color. Yes. And they, they're they the same intrinsic object if it's a lens, right? So yeah. they ought to be basically different brightnesses or shapes with the same color, the same distribution of light. Exactly, because gravitational lenses work just the same as glass lenses. The color doesn't change. You just get a different, uh, different shaped image. Okay. So I'm going to say not a lens uh, because I don't see a lens there, and I don't really see a lens anywhere else in the image. So I'll just click Next and see what I get. Now I have to say, actually, maybe I should have started from the, from the beginning because I can see here that I've done enough of these... Um, I've done 63 of, of them. Um, not like I like lost a bunch of yesterday doing this. So they're actually very quick. But um, but so I see fewer simulations now than I did at the beginning because the computer has a sense of how well I do or don't pick up lenses, and it's helping me learn how to pick up and not pick up lenses. And I've gotten apparently good enough to see them only one in ten times. So for example, I apparently haven't been wasting my time. Uh, sorry, spending my time. Uh, <laughs> So I, I get one in five simulations. So maybe maybe we could go through Let's. On, on my screen. Oh, and you have a much bigger screen, too. You can see more of it. How do we make it bigger? How do we make you it can bigger? do Command Plus. Just to, just to yeah. 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 Uh, so, right. Um, I do not see any lenses in this image. OK, so ha hang on. Just before we go on, Aphrodite was going to clarify something. We oh, lost Karen. We just lost Karen. But continue anyway. She'll, she'll rejoin. So we were just going to say that actually it's not to do with your ability, um, that, that simulation frequency. What it is is um, we kind of thought as you, you, know, you start off, you want to see more examples. And then by the time you've done 30 or so, you're less, you, know, you don't need to see so many examples. And, and actually, you want to look at images that we've um, not looked at. So that, that frequency is kind of just declining as a, as a function of the number of images you're looking at rather than how well you've done. Oh, I see. OK, so it's not necessarily that I like saw the lenses that I was supposed to see and didn't see the ones that were not there, and so it's showing me less. It's just because I've done more. Exactly, yeah. Oh, okay. we, we, we basically assume that, that, that everybody uh, is roughly uh, this has roughly the same skill at spotting lenses, and that, that doesn't change a great deal over time. And so we just gradually reduce the number of training images so that you can spend more time focused on fresh sky. Okay. All right, that makes sense. You want to try so, again? I don't know. Yeah, shall we? I was... crash again. <laughs> Is that what happened? It was just a screen yeah, share issue. I got an error. A Google Plus told me it, it had a problem. Google Plus, I think, cut off the beginning of this broadcast as well. So it's it's clearly like having an issue today. That's all right. That's okay. <laughs> we forgive um, you. As I was saying, when I was so rudely interrupted, I do not believe there are any uh, lenses in this image. So I'm just going to say next. Right? Yep. Mm -hmm. Cool. Uh, also, nothing in here. I think. <laughs> yes. I succeeded. Look, I love this, that it tells me that I did it right. Mm. OK, great. <laughs> I think Phil and Epigeter are just really enjoying watching us do this. I promise I have an account at the Zooniverse. I don't know why it's telling me that. Oh, are you not signed in? Not in. Yeah. It's really good to hear, actually, that you like the messages coming up. Because one of our concerns was we didn't want to kind of overload people with messaging. Uh, but we, we strongly felt that positive feedback of any kind would be helpful. So if that's the general view, then I think we did the right thing. And, and then it appeals to the part of me that likes being told I'm, I'm doing well. Yeah. <laughs> well. Where the teacher says, yes, you're doing it right. Um, well, one, one thing that we talked about for a long time, sorry, one thing that we talked about for a long time was, to, was whether we should tell people when, when they were going um, slightly wrong, if they'd missed a, a lens. 
And we discussed that for quite a while and in the end decided that we, that we would tell people because it's better to know. And it turns out we, we got some feedback that people actually quite like being told when they miss something because they want to get better at it. And so, you know, you, you learn a lot by, by making mistakes. And I think we're seeing that on Spacewalk. People want to know what they missed. And so they're going to their profiles and they're seeing the recent images and they're going to get, they go to find the one, that, the simulation that they missed or the, or the dub that they missed. And then you can go to talk and you can compare notes with other people and, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a way to learn after you've, uh, after you've missed something. <laughs> so, so I'm on talk right now. This is our discussion tool and uh, this is the discussion tool that actually all the new projects get, but it's a custom one for this project. Um, now, one interesting thing about this one is that when I, uh, when I have a, a, a thing that I flag as being a lens, I think I, it's in my profile, right? Where is it? Where, do, where are my collections kept? So they're down at the bottom. Underneath, you've got to scroll down. Oh, okay. Yeah. You go to your oh, there they are. All right. So it, I've been collecting artifacts just for fun, but <laughs> I've got my candidates. Um, that are the things that I have said might have lenses in them. So, for example, should we look at this one? Yeah, let's go. All right. Ooh, Brooke, that's nice. Yeah. <laughs> so, right there, I said that's definitely got to be a lens. Ooh, pretty. Right? Okay. And it, then now it says here that this is, in fact, a training image. Yeah. So that means that this is probably a simulated lens. <laughs> It is definitely a simulator. Okay. So whenever you see that label, training image, mm -hmm. means it's, a, it's a sim. Okay. And one of the things we're working on is tidying up the my candidates and the my simulations, because you have your own collection of simulations as well. There you go, to the top there, my simulations by Krasozu, I guess, yeah. Poland. Krasozu. Who, who has no idea we're talking about them. Yes. Yeah, That's so. a nice one right up there. So this person has, has been shown those simulations and they automatically get put in a, a list, a collection for them to go and look at later. So this, this tool is one of the primary things you guys are going to do science from, right? Yeah. yeah. And by, by you guys, I assume you mean every single person who comes to talk on Spacewalks. That is what I mean. I was <laughs> deliberately quite general. You yeah. Yeah, so people or people. you uh, persons instead of you guys. Oh, good point. Sorry. Oh, sorry, sorry. I'm, I'm half from America, and in America, guys is... is, uh, is I'm uh, too colloquial, yes. <laughs> um, yeah, so what we hope people will do is, is spend time in talk uh, having scientific discussions of the lens candidates that they find, and they'll hopefully make sense of things together. And by collecting any good candidate you see, that counts as a vote towards that system actually being a lens. So My Candidates is an important collection. It's where you should keep the things that you really think are gravitational lenses. And then okay. the project will collect together everyone's collections, will combine them all together, and that will be the final collaboration uh, list. Well, that's good to know, because I had one, actually, um, that I thought I couldn't tell whether it was a, a, a lens or whether it was just a bit of noise. And, uh, or, or, you know, it was very, very blue, and so it, it had an arc shape, but it, it could have been uh, just a, a weird pixel artifact or something, and I wasn't really sure. So I clicked it, and then I was looking at the, you know, known lenses and false positives, and it wasn't a training image and so forth, and I eventually changed my mind, and I said, I think that's probably just noise. So I took it out of the My Candidates collection. So are you saying that that was maybe an okay thing to do, or would you rather us not change our minds? No, I think that's a great thing to do. I think what you'll find is um, that you will have several systems like that um, whenever you decide to kind of enough enough or, or review your current candidate list. And that kind of um, assessment that you do yourself um, is really, really valuable and it will help us trim down the total collection. Yeah. Because um, yeah. there's a lot of very interesting stuff that people want to see again. And there's no harm putting them in as long as you, you're prepared to go through it and, and assess yourself how, how likely you think these things are then. Okay. 
So a... I have a really nice candidate one here, which I'm wondering if it's so nice that it must be a simulated one. <laughs> wow. Um, <laughs> so let, let's, let's mark it up. I, I was thinking that maybe we could go through the process. So I'm fin I think that's the only one in this image. So. Now, do you only want to make one mark? Oh, look. Oh, it's it's simulated. You got it. Hey. Um, <laughs> all right. <laughs> I didn't discover anything too exciting yet, but I've only done 15 images, so I guess that's fair. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Only one in 15. That's not too many. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but so the, now the question about whether you should collect something or not, it's, you know, some people like to err on the side of, you know, including everything, and other people are more discriminating. And the, what we say uh, is that there's this balance between completeness and purity. High completeness means that we've, we've detected most things that are there. Whereas high purity means that the sample of candidates that we have doesn't contain many things that are not lenses. And if you think about, you know, poor us when we have to write telescope proposals to follow up these systems, we're going to have to go through the list of candidates and decide which ones to put in our proposal. And so at that point, it's it's really good if you have a pure sample. And so we're looking for, for a fairly complete sample that's, that's pretty pure. And so if, you, if you're in doubt, if you think it might be actually noise or if you think it's not actually that convincing, don't be afraid to leave it out. OK, so we should err on the side of com uh, purity. Yeah, and, don't, and of course, the, every time you, you mark it, in the in your classification interface, you know we we we'll still we'll still have all of that information. So in talk, we should really think of it as a as an additional filter. Let's get a big list of of lens candidates from the classification interface and turn it into a pure list of, of very good candidates. Awesome! I like that. Thank you. That's good advice. <laughs> so then, what do you do with that? Now let's let's assume because you guys got your what a six hundred fifty are we at seven hundred thousand classifications so far, just in the first day. Seven hundred thousand, I think. <laughs> <laughs> my analysis just finished. Let me tell you how many. Oh people. yes, because I definitely want I want to hear about how the analysis works because this is really interesting. It's a it's a fairly new kind of analysis that's being done here, and it's something that we might eventually be able to apply throughout many projects in the universe. So I think a lot of people would be interested in it. Oh yeah. Okay. So so we we just finished the first five hundred and ten thousand classifications. Okay. So, so that's right. five hundred and ten thousand images. Five hundred and ten thousand classifications of forty three thousand images. So that's good because it means we have lots of information about each one. Mm. Uh, at the beginning, we wanted to do that because we wanted to understand understand how, how we all how we all work um, we need to understand how often we all make mistakes and how good we really are at spotting lenses and rejecting images that don't contain lenses and once we have an understanding of, of, of how good we all are then we can use that understanding to make good decisions about whether to keep a lens candidate or not keep a lens candidate so we're trying to make decisions based on probability. We're calculating the probability that each image contains a lens, and then deciding whether or not to keep it based on that probability. So what does it look like? Stunned silence from the <laughs> hangout. <laughs> I had myself on mute. I thought I was going to sneeze. So, so what, is the, uh, what does it look like? Can you show us plots, even if you just have to hold the screen up? Because you had a movie, or you were like animating how how the candidates moved in yeah, the kind of yeah. probability space. That, if I remember that's, correctly, that's a bit too confusing. Oh come on! No, no, you, you can wait for the blog post on. Oh. <laughs> oh, that was not in the in the know here. Phil and uh, Aprajita are sitting behind Brooke, behind the door. Yeah. Oh, no, we could, basically, another. we could all photobomb each other, and Kyle's like in the next office. Waving each other through those doors, right? Yeah. Yeah. I can probably shout very, very loud, and um, right. Okay. Uh, even if I mute myself. <laughs> anyway, um, so 
I was just because because obviously the next thing we want to know is first of all uh, how long will it be before we know how many lenses have been discovered and because you've got this great analysis but that can sometimes take time and that's great because it wants we want to make sure it's careful. How, how big um, is the whole survey? Have you seen? So up to now, um, so the first chunk that Phil just mentioned that's forty three thousand. That's one tenth of this particular survey. So um, there's still a way to go. Um, but you know, if we see interesting things as we go along, then you know that's that's exactly the point of talk. That's where we're announcing them. That's where they'll be discussed, and that's where we them be there. So you know, if you <laughs> <Ooh. laughs> if you see something great time. and cool, and you're excited about, please talk about it. That's the best way to make it prominent. Um, to check talk and the blog, presumably. Yeah. Cool, cool. So, uh, so there was something that people have been talking about. This has been in the press for a while. Is about brown dwarfs. Because mm. I always think of of gravitational lenses as being really strong probes of dark matter, which is really interesting. But what yeah. about brown dwarfs? So brown dwarfs are some of the faintest stars we know about, and we've only ever really seen them in our own galaxy. They're, they're almost like, almost failed stars. They, they kind of flick it a bit, and then <laughs> they don't really shine very brightly at all. It's because they never got big enough. And so they're very difficult to see, and especially difficult to see in other galaxies. We can barely see them in our own. So if you imagine a, a massive galaxy full of stars, and then imagine that massive galaxy also being full of brown dwarfs. Those brown dwarfs are dark, in the sense that they're not shining. And so if you want to... Do you, if you want to be able to study them in other galaxies, you have to have some way of, no, of figuring out that they're there, even when you can't see them. And that's what the gravitational lens lets you do. Gravitational lenses let you weigh galaxies. Right? When you see, did we have a picture of a lens? Is that yes, one? Bill has one up. I think. Bill has one up, yeah. Well, it's, Is that, that actually was going to illustrate a, a more subtle point that connects with one of my maniacal obsessions. <laughs> uh, distortion by gravitational lensing is something we have to start worrying about when we extend uh, dust studies from overlapping galaxies. Oh, I see. Hubble Zoom, because then the distances involved give a long enough lever arm that the foreground galaxy may distort the image of the background galaxy, so we have to allow for that possibility in working out how much light is missing. Mm. I think we should call that and an this, opportunity. And this was, I think, the first uh, purely Hubble overlap that I became aware of. It's on the edge of the CIS field in the HDF South. Mm. But this is v that's very nearby example, right? So in that, actually, even in that, we probably wouldn't see brown dwarfs. This, right, right. Well, uh, the the best place to look for brown dwarfs is uh, in something like a quasar lens, where you can see the the effect of a single star passing through the beam, or collectively seeing that. Now, in is, fact, is that something that's that different from what we're talking about here, Phil? I... No, it's, it's all related. So okay. Bill was just describing a, uh, a brown dwarf. And again, at, at the risk of indulging a mania, <laughs> this this data set was specifically taken to look for lensing of stars in the background galaxy by the front by the foreground galaxy over a period of a couple of years, uh, because one of the micro lensing pundits convinced me that my back of the envelope estimate was an order of magnitude too pessimistic about how long you'd expect to see that. Okay, so and now I, fact, I, there's, I there's evidence that we did see star star lensing events. Okay, so now so I, many jargon gongs. Yeah, we, we have to jargon gong that like ten times because there was what star star lensing, micro lensing, and I'm gonna have to turn to the experts on this one. Can you guys talk about the difference between those? Uh, sure, sure. That that picture's cool though, right? I mean, you know how we ask people at the at the front page, we say, "Think of a galaxy behind another mm. galaxy." Well, that's what we imagine most people thinking of. That's a galaxy in front of another galaxy. Mm. But it looks different from the lenses we're after because our background galaxies are way in the background. So they're very small, very distant. 
and they're the ones that, because of the way the geometry works for a lens, they're the ones that can be distorted in a big way. If you have two galaxies that are very close to each other, like this, very close to each other, then you don't get a very strong lensing effect. Um, but anyway, what we were, talk we were talking about brown dwarfs. We were talking about brown dwarfs, which led us to microlensing and, y yes. Tell us about okay. brown dwarfs, because I always think of it as dark matter, and brown dwarfs are not strictly speaking what we normally talk about. Right. Talk brown about dwarfs aren't really dark matter with a capital D and a capital M. They're just... Matter that is dark. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> matter that doesn't really shine very Very good. Yeah. So the, there's... Brown dwarfs are a problem in other galaxies. You can't see them, but you can, you can infer that they're there by measuring their gravitational effects. Mm. And one of them is if they happen to pass in front of a distant quasar, they can cause a little blip of magnification as they go and pass. And that's microlensing. But what we're interested in with the kinds of lenses that we hope to find on, and in space warps and have been found already in the CFHC Legacy Survey are massive galaxies that contain, presumably, lots and lots of brown dwarfs that we can't see because they're not shining, but that we'd like to study. And so what we do is we weigh the galaxy with gravitational lensing, we measure the separation between the multiple images that we were looking at a minute ago, and that tells us, roughly speaking, how much total mass there is in the galaxy. So we can weigh a galaxy, and then we can compare that galaxy's weight with what we would predict just by looking at it. So when you look at a galaxy and you know how far away it is, you can guess or estimate from its brightness and from its color how much mass in stars there should be, how much stellar mass there is. And so we can predict stellar mass from the colors and brightnesses, and then we can compare it with the actual stellar mass that we get from modeling the gravitational lensing effect. So you model it by, you, you put a you, you put it into a computer simulation and try to reproduce the the configuration that you see, which is a very specific, it, how hard it was on the wine glasses to get that cross exactly right. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Uh, and so you you have then mm -hmm. a sense of how the matter is distributed. Yeah. My, this is my understanding of it, which tells you, because the dark matter, the actual capital D, capital M, dark mm -hmm. matter is distributed differently than the stars and the brown dwarfs. We think, we think, so, yeah. think it is. Right. Probably. Well, yeah. So, but so the, that the, so the technique so the matter that is dark with a little with little m's and d's should be distributed in the same way as the as the stars that we see, right? That's um, what we assume. So we say, let's yeah. suppose that the brown dwarf stars are distributed in the same way as the yellow stars that we see. Yeah. And then let's make a little model for the gravitating mass of this galaxy. Let's, let's try and predict the, the arcs that we see in the gravitational lens system. And when we make that model, we put in some dark matter distributed one way and some stars distributed another way. Mm -hmm. And we leave the average mass per star as a free parameter. And that's the thing that we really try mm -hmm. and uh, estimate. Mm -hmm. It's in the literature for some odd historical reason, that parameter is known as the mass to light ratio. But it's, it's more helpful to think of it as the average mass per star. Yeah, it, it's called that just because that's, we can measure the light, and then you can multiply by the mass divided by the light to get the mass. Right, exactly. So astronomers like things that are nice algebraic, simple yeah. <laughs> things, when we can help it. Yeah, so I can tell you that, that in, the, in what we've seen so far, in the lenses we've seen so far, it looks like the these massive galaxies can be up to twice as heavy as they appear from their brightness and color. So that's a lot of hidden, unseen, stellar type mass. Right, that's potentially a lot of brown dwarfs. Interesting. It doesn't, it, that's not going to change our estimation of dark matter a lot, is it? No, because we, we, in our model we, 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 uh, we estimate the amount of dark matter at the same time. Okay. And we still find that we need dark matter with a capital D and a capital M. Uh, but we also find that we need extra brown dwarfs. Cool. And, and this is interesting. We didn't expect this. 
Yeah, that is an unexpected result. Okay. So I guess the moral of the story is uh, we're doing pretty well with the classification. It's been a very popular uh, launch so far, but we need your help. We still need your help. Ooh, yeah, this is, <laughs> this is my, uh, my current screenshot. I just refreshed this. I will refresh it again. It, this has been about a minute and a half between those two. So we're, getting, we're still getting a good number of classifications, but uh, there's still quite a lot of, of imaging to go through. So, you have a lot um, of tabs open, bro. I, I always do. Yeah. I always, always do. <laughs> so. All right, so spacewarps.org. Thank you, everybody. And uh, anybody else have any questions, things they want to discuss? I, was, I wanted to just mention yeah. the, uh, the galaxies on my screen. So, um, so that since this is a Galaxy Zoo Hangout, um, many of the, our users will remember that for, um, for a couple of years now, we've also asked you if you've seen lenses in Galaxy Zoo. So it's at the end of the question tree, and you asked if you see... see. Ah, look, we have a visitor. <laughs> Come on in, Chris. You're on a hangout as well. Come We're on. all on the yeah, same hangout, on. Chris. Hangout. Come on no, in, it's fine. Come We're going to go and do some work. That's He's a... not going to come into his own office because that's where I am. <laughs> um, <laughs> He's going to try one. Okay, you guys keep talking. Okay. So anyhow, for, we've asked you whether you've seen lenses in Galaxy Zoo over the years. And so part of this is as part of the regular classifications. Um, part of these are, I know we have a very dedicated group of some of our volunteers who have uh, found individual galaxies in their collections and on the forum, which is kind of a, a pre-version of what Space Warps is hoping to do in the same way. So I've just chosen five examples from, this is from the Galaxy Zoo 2 site, so a couple years ago. These are images from Sloan, so they look a bit different than the images that are in Space Warps, but these are ones that your vote selected as being very probable lens candidates. And I thought I would show these to uh, Phil and Aprigida and ask, do you, do you happen to recognize any of these, or know if they, any of them are possible real lenses? Yeah, I mean, I've, I've done quite a bit on the Galaxy mm -hmm. Zoo lens group. Um, mm -hmm. Personally, looking at these, I think the most likely one is probably the fourth one along. The fourth but, one over, because mm -hmm. you can... But it's a bit hard to tell without the scales, so... Um, it's true, sorry, and these, are, these aren't zoomed in the best way. Um, yeah. And one reason is that the, uh, the, fourth, uh, the, the fourth one is also of a different color than uh, the, the lens and galaxy and the possible lensed one. Um, the yeah. colors... Really it's kind of like a little hint of something of similar on the other on side. The side, but mm -hmm. it's, that's kind of the problem with the the Sloan images. They're just not good enough quality to do this really well. And what they're actually mm -hmm. really good for is finding kind of more complicated lenses where you have a group mm -hmm. of galaxies acting together as a lens. Mm -hmm. So, um, kind of these are all like single galaxies that are lensing other single galaxies behind them. But if you can imagine you've got a group of these all together, mm -hmm. um, the res you can actually get a, a bigger deflection. So your image of the background galaxy is more kind of separated from the group. And that's where the Sloan resolution kind of limits how much you can do with these single galaxies. So not to disappoint everyone, but looking at these five, I wouldn't. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't put my money on them. As no, it. I think it's it's a great example of kind of of the the need for the dedicated project like Space Warps, um, and and the ability to um, the ability to collect some of them in Sloan has been, I think, kind of an important precursor to it. Oh, definitely. And yeah. several of the people who have volunteered for Galaxy Zoo have been very very much involved in the planning and execution of Space Warps, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Some some of the 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 lens hunters from the from the forum have been helping us design the, the zoo and are now active in talk. So they're actually part of the, the science team at Space Warps and they'll be continuing to help us throughout the, the project as it goes along. Okay, great. There were a couple of questions that came in on uh, Brooke's blog post just oh. while we were talking about this. One was actually a question about the zooites who have been particularly active in setting up uh, Space Warps. And there was a question on do you need to have spectra of the candidate objects to really confirm that you're dealing with a gravitational lens? I guess that's a little bit subjective. Um, personally, I think yes. Um, if you really want a, a concrete um, result that all the little multiple images that you see have exactly the same 
spectra, mm. so the same redshifts, um, the same properties, then you're kind of almost certain that, that they're lenses, but coupled with that, you need to have a good model so that you can reproduce that configuration, and you really need the two. Mm. But then having said that, a lot of papers are published without spectroscopic confirmation, so yeah. it's a little bit of a mixed bag, I would say. And, and part of the reason for that is that spectra are very expensive to get. And so a, a good strategy is to first find very good lens candidates using just images and then get them out there so that anybody who has who a big telescope can investigate them further with spectroscopy. And there was one, one final question about whether you could infer brown dwarfs from the wing forward absorption bands or whether those are just good for him dwarfs. Gong, gong Bell, gong. <laughs> <laughs> but a quick go because we're well out. over time. <laughs> yeah, and I think maybe we'll save some uh, discussion of brown dwarfs and low mass stars for another hangout. Um, Unless Phil, you can enter that very quickly. No, but uh, Abrajita had something. You were about to say something before oh, Phil. Oh no, it was, it was about the galaxies, but it's okay. fine. Okay. Well, or just to say that we haven't given up on the original galaxy zoo lens sample. Mm. So you know there are <laughs> lenses in there, and actually you know a lot of them have been confirmed by other members of the community uh, since they were discovered on the zoo. So, you know, we know that there's good stuff in there and we're still looking at those resources. So, yeah. It's so all I wonder if this means that we should be having, uh, that Space Warp should be having its own hangout, A, and then two, or B, <laughs> A and then two, that we should, <laughs> that we should maybe be uh, talking about brown dwarfs on another hangout at some point. I think so. Sure. There's clearly enough information. Yeah. So if it's okay, we'll we'll postpone we'll the second question. Yes. Yes. We that would be excellent because I'm definitely not an expert in brand voice, <laughs> uh, but I know someone who is. So, uh, okay. So, thank you everyone for joining. And uh, sorry we went a little bit out uh, over time. I hope that I know Apergita and Karen both have to go somewhere. So I hope that uh, we're not too late. But uh, thanks for joining everyone, and thanks for watching everyone. And um, see you next time. Bye. Bye.